we're very lucky to have Jaya. She works at the Royal Brisbane Women's Hospital in the University of Queensland and has had uh, some great successes with a, a recent PhD and uh, winning fellowships uh, because of his wonderful research into nebulized antimicrobial therapy. Uh, pursuant to this, he has developed um, you know, fantastic expertise in this area and we're really looking forward to what he has to say um, about his topic, which is very broad, inhaled antibiotic therapy. And so uh, hopefully he's um, able to present to us his, his thoughts on, on this matter, which uh, I think is a really important topic for future research uh, to help us define when and if it should ever really be used in patients. Thank you. Thank you very much for the um, opportunity to talk at this um, webinar. Um, no uh, talk on dose optimization and, uh, and sepsis talk uh, currently is completed without uh, a, some sort of discussion on on this novel way of delivering antibiotics, which is uh, why the inhalation route, especially in light of the fact that um, a large proportion of what we see in hospitals and in clinical medicine um, is one way or the other uh, related to respiratory medicine. And you do have pneumonia as one of the, or respiratory infection as one of the commonest indications for presentation and admission into the hospital. So just as a brief outline of what we're going to talk about um, today, uh, we'll briefly touch on each of these topics. Um, so the first known reference of using any <clears throat> therapeutic aerosol for uh, clinical effect is, is through the Egyptian papyrus. Um, they ended up using um, a herbane plant uh, for treatment of asthma. But even before that, um, up to 2000 BC, actually there was um, a, a record um, of using datura uh, as the treatment for asthma. So uh, therapeutic use of aerosol um, dates back really, really uh, long actually. Um, lung infections uh, are one of the most common infections um, and actually lead to about 50% of the antibiotic use. Um, systematic, uh, systemic administration is the mainstay of therapy. Um, though the cure rate remains up to 50%. Um, the advent of antibiotic era between uh, 1950s to 70s um, changed the landscape uh, regarding the management of lung infections, uh, resulting in significant decrease in mortality. Um, however, of late, due to overuse and other factors, um, there have been uh, a significant increase in the emergence of multidrug resistant organisms as a cause of lung infections. Um, systemic toxicity associated with um, the conventional way of antibiotic administration limits the amount of antibiotic you can actually give uh, with, and, and that's um, you know, reducing the ability to manage these multidrug resistant organism related infections. Uh, besides, um, the antibiotic pipeline is not as productive as it used to be in the past. Um, and that all has led uh, clinicians to think of alternative solutions. One alternative solution of note is uh, the inhalation antibiotic route. So following the philosophy of local problem equals local solution, um, antibiotic administration by inhalation um, inherently is a very appealing alternative um, due to the possibility of achieving higher local concentrations in the lungs, which is the site of action for uh, patients suffering from lung infections with uh, limited systemic side effects. So what's holding us back? What are, the, what are the reasons why things are not quite as active as they need to be? Why, why is this um, method of administration of antibiotic not as common as we think they should be? Um, one of the problems is uh, a numerous number of factors that affect um, effective inhalation antibiotic therapy. A number of factors, including patient-related factors, some drug-related factors, and device-related factors as well. Um, besides, there are very few inhalation specific formulations. We know that there are uh, formulations such as amikacin, tetrabromycin, astronam, and colistin as some of the few formulations which are quite 
specific for inhalation purpose only. The data regarding the pharmacokinetics is not adequate to inform the dosing uh, and dosing interval. Besides, there are concerns about sputum inhibition um, as one of the reasons for uh, lack of clinical effect. Lastly, um, large clinical trials um, are lacking uh, to provide uh, robust evidence to support uh, their wider use as well. So let's consider some of the factors that affect the um, aerosol drug delivery. So we find drug-related factors such as dosing, particle size, volume. Volume because the nebulizer, for example, um, has got limitations in terms of uh, its reservoir volume, which is up to five mils at most, which limits the amount of drug that can be administered at a time. Device, you have the type of nebulizers, for example, um, the position in the circuit, especially when it is used for uh, a ventilator-associated pneumonia type of medications. Nebulization time, the longer it is, the harder it is to administer the drugs. Um, Ventilator-related factors, which influence the drug delivery, um, circuit-related factors, and lastly, but not least, uh, patient-related factors, most of which are non-modifiable. The particle size seems to be the most um, easy or, or obvious uh, parameter that can be uh, studied and modified. And as we see over here, it is the magic range of sort of one to five micron particle size range, which um, provides effective uh, distal lung deposition, which is the side of action uh, for inhalation antibiotics. Some of the device related factors. Now we know we are almost in the third generation nebulizer. The first generation nebulizer that we know of is the jet nebulizer. The second generation nebulizer is the ultrasonic nebulizer. And the current uh, generation nebulizer that uh, we're using is called the vibrating mesh uh, technology, which uh, involves having a mesh which has uh, got 1,000 uh, precision uh, holes actually at the base of the plate of the nebulizer, uh, which generates one to five micron particle size. Um, and that is the most effective way of nebulizing antibiotics. Position of the nebulizer in the ventilator circuit is one of the other important factors which affects uh, delivery, largely because of the uh, lack of being able to synchronize with the inhalation. So with mechanically ventilated patients, for example, uh, position of the nebulizer in the inspiratory limb 15 centimeter from the Y piece uh, is desirable. Um, there is a point of contention that whether the dry side of humidifier is a better position, but that yet is yet to be seen and, and actually established as a practice, uh, mostly because uh, in vivo evidence of its efficacy is, uh, is lacking. When using non-invasive ventilator, the position should ideally be after the exhalation port. And when using high flow nasal prongs, the position uh, on the dry side of the humidifier seems to be the most optimal uh, to be able to deliver um, high quantity of uh, antibiotics into the disc lungs. Drug related factors are the most obvious factors that are modifiable. Uh, one can hardly change patient-related factors um, or organism-related factors, but um, drug-related factors certainly are the commonest factors that we could actually modify. Some of the most common ways of administering inhaler antibiotics are, are nebulization and dry powder. Um, dry powder is limited because of a number of limitations where patient coordination is, is necessary. Um, you can mostly do it in non-ventilated patients. Um, there are some specific powder-related formulations available, but they're quite limited as you see, whereas with nebulization, not only there are specific formulations, but one could actually repurpose um, preservative-free intravenous formulation uh, for the purpose of nebulization. So inherently nebulization seems to be a bit more easier uh, to administer as compared to dry powder. Uh, but there, are, there is one specific advantage that I actually found quite useful with dry powder, which is uh, to be able to deliver a larger payload, uh, larger quantity of antibiotic as compared to uh, nebulization. 
which is um, limited by the device volume. Besides the device uh, related factors, um, there is the issue with the antibiotic solution itself. There are some key features that we must actually look at uh, when we deliver antibiotics via the inhalation route. Um, tonicity, osmolarity, and pH being one of the uh, other three major sort of aspects we've found for tolerability because hypertonic and hypotonic as well as um, osmotic, uh, hypo and hyper uh, would cause significant intolerance, including bronchospasm and other complications um, when administered via the inhalation route. When it comes to pharmacokinetic principles of aerosol therapy, um, unlike the uh, conventional way of um, administering antibiotics, which is uh, which has got a pharmacokinetic principle of, of uh, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion, with um, regard to aerosol therapy or inhalation therapy, um, delivery is the key component. It actually is the rate limiting step, in fact, uh, for effective inhaled antibiotic therapy. Some of the ventilator parameters that affect um, effective distal lung delivery um, are in the form of airflow rate and pattern. Again, not difficult to understand because um, the key is that the air is actually the conduit. It actually is the carrier of this aerosol. And so a laminar flow um, is certainly the most effective way of um, uh, delivering the antibiotic through the inhalation route into the distal lung as compared to uh, a turbulent flow, and therefore a slow uh, square wave pattern of breathing is actually a better way of um, breathing for antibiotic delivery. Um, a minimal tidal volume of about 400 to 500 mils is required, again, for, for carrying the antibiotic through into the distal lung. Um, a synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation mode is better than a pressure support mode. And again, inspiratory expiratory ratio wise, the longer the inspiratory time, uh, the higher is the chance of delivering the antibiotic into the distal lung. So for this part, we can actually conclude that the in vitro data is strong enough to say that a mesh nebulizer is better. Uh, we must actually optimize the ventilator settings to ensure laminar flow. Uh, we must position the nebulizer optimally choose the right type of formulation and see if we can actually optimize any form of patient related factors such as enabling deep breathing, uh, IE ratio and flow pattern to optimize um, the distal lung delivery. But despite optimizing, what you find is the drug deposition quantity um, does not seem to be as much as intravenous when, especially when actually Technology such as uh, scintigraphic uh, method is used to evaluate the lung deposition in the lungs. So our group actually looked at um, studying uh, radio-labeled topromycin in uh, ventilated large animal model, um, comparing intravenous as compared to the nebulized lungs, uh, nebulized route of lung uh, drug delivery, um, comparing the amount of uh, drug deposited in the lungs. And what we find is a, compared to nebulized, which is 8.8%, the IV actually seems to achieve a higher amount of deposition in the lung. But what we do know is that it, the lung is not as simple as that. The interstitial space fluid is the um, site of um, infection and it is the site of drug action. What this picture does not show is where is it? Uh, in the lung, in the various compartments in the lung that this drug is. It could be in the vascular compartment, it could be interstitial compartment, or it could be in the alveolar compartment. So the key is to actually look into uh, the details further. And what we find when we evaluate the lung tissue concentrations, so this is in, again, um, piglet models, a large animal model, um, looking at a comparison of healthy piglets and inoculated piglets uh, with uh, inhaled amikacin. The lung, lung was actually retrieved um, post-mortem and um, a tissue homogenate was obtained following which lung concentration, the concentrations of amikacin was measured in the lung homogenates. 
finding fairly high concentrations of amikacin uh, in patient in, in the piglets that were given inhaled amikacin. Our group went that one step forward because again, that lung tissue concentration would not have told, uh, told us information with regard to where exactly is this antibody. So we performed um, in a large animal model, sheep in particular, a mechanically ventilated healthy sheep. We performed uh, lung microdialysis based interstitial space fluid uh, sampling over an eight hour period and measured antibody concentration in different parts of the lung. So two on each side of the lungs, so right upper lobe, right lower lobe, left upper lobe and left lower lobe and measured antibiotic concentrations in the lung tissue, demonstrating that you could achieve a fairly high uh, peak tobramycin concentration with nebulizers compared to intravenous um, with some variabilities between the different parts of the lung. So what we glean from this, um, these studies is, is few points. Actually, we could say that the uh, lung deposition volume with nebulized antibiotic is less, but it still seems to be adequate to achieve uh, therapeutic concentrations into the interstitial space fluid. So then we move on to what are the clinical applications that we could see. Now the obvious difference, differences in terms of patient group is going to be cystic fibrosis and the non-cystic fibrosis group. The whole area of interest with inhaled antibiotics commenced with patients uh, suffering from this uh, disease called a cystic fibrosis. Um, over time, uh, with lots of um, randomized controlled trials, actually it was clearly demonstrated benefit in this area, uh, especially for cystic fibrosis patients. Uh, chronic suppressive therapy is the commonest use of inhaled antibiotic in this group, um, where airway is the site of infection. Long-term uh, observational studies and clinical trials actually showed that the side effects were quite low. And now it's actually formed part of a uh, standard care actually in this group of patients. In this group, particular group of patients, uh, these two are the commonest antibiotics, tobramycin and estronum. They are the most um, commonest used antibiotics and approved antibiotics for this purpose. The approved period is of uh, 28 days and uh, typically uh, they are administered in an alternate way to basically reduce the selection pressure. Um, there seems to be some benefit, interestingly, even in drug-resistant strains, perhaps because of the high or super, you know, significantly high concentration that it can achieve that may override the concerns about uh, drug-resistant strains in these group of patients. When it comes to the non-cystic fibrosis group, um, there are Fundamentally, two groups of interest in adults, especially. Um, one is bronchiectasis, and uh, the second is uh, ventilator-associated infections, chiefly tracheobronchitis and tracheitis as well. And then the other group is ventilator-associated pneumonia. So what, what, um, what does the study studies in this bronchiectasis, adult bronchiectasis group show? It, sh it suggests that there is a significantly good tolerance it does reduce bacterial load. Um, the reduction in exacerbation frequency with bronchiectasis is lesser with using inhaled antibiotics, but does not translate into improvement in quality of life or, or survival. When it comes to using ventilator and uh, inhaled antibiotics in ventilator associated pneumonia, which is one of the other indications for using inhaled antibiotics, um, the, over the number of years, the number of RCTs have been done and um, mostly most of, most of the RCTs are of small size and poor quality. Unfortunately, they also don't seem to give the details required as per our previous discussion in terms of devices and ventilator settings. So it's hard to actually know whether the, all the factors were optimized um, in those individual RCTs um, so most of the results are very, very hard to interpret vis-a-vis -vis the in vitro data um, regarding those optimization and delivery. Um, so the, hence you actually see a, a large variability in terms of clinical response. 
recently, um, we've had a series of um, clinical trials. So we have the phase two inhaled amikacin trial, the AFIS trial, the inhaled trial. Most of them were adjunctive antibiotic trials, um, and all of them uh, had a significantly different outcome differences. Um, predominantly, no differences seems to be the, the commonest uh, outcomes we see, except for this one study. A meta-analysis um, done on using adjunctive aerosolized amikacin, uh, although it showed a favorable outcome, uh, one would actually see in terms of these studies and the size of the um, studies itself, that most of the uh, studies done recently seem to be either equivocal or actually moving towards not favorable. Some of the older studies, which were of smaller size, seem to favor and hence um, skew the uh, results of the meta-analysis. So this is, this is an ongoing problem of, uh, of work being done in this area. So what, what have we learned from the results, re, uh, results of the um, clinical trials, especially the re re recent clinical trials um, in regard to the causes of the failure? One of the major problems is um, the uniformity in diagnosis of um, ventilator-associated pneumonia. Um, there, there, there remains a ongoing controversy of the diagnosis. And, and diagnostic uh, uh, features actually for ventilator associated pneumonia. It gets compounded by the variable definitions used to define what is clinical cure. These inconsistencies therefore lead to uh, making ventilator associated pneumonia a poor target when it comes for drug approval. In terms of methodology, um, again, deep diving into each of those randomized control trials, uh, there is a wide variability in terms of the de delivery devices used, the ventilator settings used, uh, the depths of formulations and the doses used uh, even actually, which makes it very, very hard to compare the uh, outcomes from individual studies. Moreover, um, one can say that mortality, uh, while it is appealing as an endpoint, um, because it is binary, you know, you're either dead or you're alive. Um, it is increasingly, increasingly difficult to assign an attributable mortality uh, due to the con confounding factors associated with um, diagnosing both VAP and VAT. Um, so perhaps um, for, the, for the future clinical trials could look at different other endpoints such as emergence of bacterial resistance, which in small trials has seen to be of benefit, like inhaled antibiotics does seem to reduce the incidence of bacterial resistance, uh, or some of the other indirect uh, parameters such as uh, ventilation time, uh, length of stay, uh, and so on and so forth, actually, because um, again, as I said, uh, the difficulty is, um, modality is, is very difficult to attribute to VAP as the, as the sole cause. So where are we with regard to interpreting the evidence with, regarding to, with regards to recommendations for its use in BAP or BAT in particular? Um, look, the evidence at this point in time appears quite low and weak to support its use either as a, as a standalone or as an adjunct, um, predominantly because of um, very small trials uh, which are not uh, well designed uh, and perhaps um, further improvement in the design of the trial and the homogeneous population with, with clear description of um, dosing and pharmacokinetic data uh, would be uh, more informative actually before its um, uh, recommendation for a wider use. So the big question is, should we or should we not use inhaled antibiotics in clinical practice? Now, one group is very clear, cystic fibrosis. Um, for the other, as in the non-cystic fibrosis group, uh, the data remains um, quite ambiguous and does need further um, studies in this area. Um, anecdotally, uh, we've used in clinical practice in intensive care when we deal with patients who suffer from multidrug-resistant infections um, and uh, hard to 
uh, treat uh, type of pneumonia uh, predominantly as an adjunct rather than as a sole agent. So at this point in time, if it, if it is used properly, um, I suppose uh, on a case by case basis, uh, one can consider using it. Um, with limited data, especially limited pharmacokinetic data, uh, based on published reports, one can come with a, a series of recommendations with regard to the suggested doses when it comes to dosing inhalation antibiotics. But again, um, more work needs to be done in this um, area of medicine. Where do I see the uh, future work being done? Um, larger clinical trials truly are required actually, um, but they must take into account um, optimal delivery uh, data and should optim the delivery data should be reported in these studies uh, for it to be taken into account when applying those information in clinical practice. Um, some of the newer formulations are coming through, so it will be an interesting time going forward, such as um, phage and combination antimicrobial therapies. Um, PKPD studies uh, would certainly be useful um, especially uh, optimizing delivery data and, and then doing the PKPD studies to inform dosing and then using those dosing one can actually apply to clinical trials. Newer delivery de devices are on the horizon, nano delivery in particular, and finally dry powder delivery uh, certainly cannot be discounted uh, just yet actually. Um, over time, I, presume, I, I would think that um, more and more dry powder delivery type of studies will, will come through as well. So in summary, um, inhalation antibiotics do have a great potential uh, in terms of its application in clinical medicine. Um, optimizing drug delivery is the key for clinical effect. Um, current evidence uh, remains very weak uh, for, uh, for it to be recommended for a wider use. Um, and, a, and a significant amount of research, especially large clinical trials with optimized delivery is required uh, before um, recommending um, a wider use. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thanks very much, Jayesh. Uh, we don't have any questions in the chat at the moment, but whilst uh, Luminita is trying to bring up Mo's presentation again, I'm going to ask a question if I may, Jayesh. And uh, that relates to the, the false dawn, perhaps, that some of the pharmacokinetic studies that have been published provide when looking at epithe... Can you unshare your screen, sorry? Um, when looking at uh, epithelial lining fluid concentrations, which a lot of people suggest that's a really good surrogate for uh, where infections are, um, where concentrations of antibiotics should be measured in the lung to describe what an infection site concentration is. Uh, but because of the way that nebulization is performed, that you may actually get uh, higher concentrations there because of like a, um, a deposition, which is different to the deposition that we usually consider in the context of uh, aerosolized antibiotics, but really it just sits on the uh, epithelial lining fluid and doesn't necessarily represent what's penetrating across into the interstitial fluid. Do you have any comments about cautioning people about how to interpret those studies? And look, that's an excellent question, actually. Um, the, the exact um, sample to be used um, for doing the pharmacokinetic studies um, has evolved over time, actually. Um, mostly because in the earlier stages of investigation in this area, the technology wasn't mature enough. So one had to use a surrogate marker. So right from using sputum samples, um, which we know in time actually has been um, a, a, an in, incomplete or inadequate um, sampling technique, uh, down to ELF, which is uh, BL in this case, all of which have had their limitations. Um, what we found in our work um, in the sheep study that we uh, discussed briefly during my presentation was uh, there was a significant amount of um, central airway deposition. Um, so it is not inconceivable if you're gonna use a bronchoalveolar lavage that um, the bronchoscope as it goes through uh, the trachea might actually get contaminated with this proximal deposited um, 
antibiotic actually and may give you a false impression of a very, very high concentration. Um, uh, you know, for, for uh, people who are interested, I'm, I'm happy to share that paper. Right. So that will be, uh, see, that, that's what we found actually is that there was a significant discrepancy between the epithelial lining fluid concentration um, as compared to the interstitial space fluid concentration, um, which made us think that uh, there's, there's clearly a significant component of um, possibly a contamination of the bronchoscope as it actually goes through the airway, uh, which is where um, a significant amount of deposition was because in the distal lung itself, um, as we saw, it was only about eight to 10% of uh, the delivered dose that got deposited actually. So um, interpreting the epithelial lining fluid concentration is fraught with, um, with uh, misleading uh, information. And uh, the difficulty is that uh, on the other side uh, is to actually work out what then is the better way of interpreting uh, concentration because while we did work with um, lung microdialysis, it is a semi-invasive technique. It's not necessarily practical to do it in, in vivo in, um, in humans especially, uh, but uh, what would probably help over time is in, in infected large animal model using a variety of different doses actually work out uh, what is the best uh, uh, amount of uh, dose that might be uh, optimally able to achieve a, uh, a therapeutic concentration in the interstitial space fluid. That's very well said, Jayesh. And for those that are interested, Jayesh is taking PhD students and just described a perfect topic for someone who really wants to solve this area. So thanks again, Jayesh. That was wonderful.